having me here today <coughs> to do this lecture. So the, uh, the title is uh, Imaging the Voices of the Past Using Physics to Restore Early Sound Recordings. So there's already a, some sort of a contradiction, imaging and voices. We don't normally uh, think of those things in the same, uh, in the same context. But as you'll see in the talk, what, what we've done is we've tried to bring in um, some techniques out of the, the field of imaging and apply them to uh, sound recordings, which are then treated as, as objects which we'd like to measure. Um, you know, my, my, uh, my field, as Dan said, is particle physics, which is, has something to do with studying basic properties of matter and energy and recreating the conditions of the early universe. So, you know, what am I doing here at all talking about sound? Um, I don't really know very much about it. By the time the talk is over, you may conclude that I know nothing about it. But anyway, uh, you know, in the course of the years that we've been doing this, we've learned a whole bunch of, of techniques, and it turns out that, that they can be brought to bear um, on this problem. So just to kind of give you a quick little snapshot, um, here's Fermilab, so an example of a large accelerator complex, so sort of four miles. In circumference, if we zoom in, uh, that's the CDF detector, uh, which is located over here and it's being inserted. And uh, here, if we zoom into there on the sort of meter scale, this is a tracking system which is used to measure the trajectories of particles. And if we zoom in again to the inch or so centimeter scale, um, here is the microelectronics and the detector arrays that, that comprise this thing. And when events occur, we get images like this reconstructed on the computer showing the tracks of particles that pass through. And to do all of this, there's a couple of, of things you have to do. You have to be able to massively collect and analyze data on a large scale. Um, you have to use computerized pattern recognition methods to analyze the signals and pick out the noise and the real data from images like this. And you have to use precision mechanical survey methods um, to build and align and, and position all of these things. So we were going along doing this for 15 or 20 years. Uh, learning how to do it hopefully better and better. Then around 2000 uh, just happened uh, that we heard a, uh, a news a report on, on National Public Radio and they were saying that the Library of Congress had large collections of sound recordings which were of a mechanical nature like phonograph records or, or um, cylinders and these were considered somehow to be at risk. They were some of them, they were obviously very old, some of them were damaged, some of them might be uh, uh, damaged even more if they tried to play them by, by contacting the surface with a needle. And this was a, a very big problem, and if we didn't find some way to stabilize these collections and transfer them into the digital domain around now, uh, perhaps they would, some would be lost forever, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think just hearing that, we were struck that, that some of the same methods that, that we use to build these things, uh, precision optical methods to position our sensors, the, the pattern recognition and noise analysis that we apply, um, we thought, well, you know, why don't they just apply some of these methods uh, and treat these things as sort of a measurement problem rather than try to play them with a needle? And we started to talk about this in the lab and, uh, and kind of got interested in it and started to, to, do, to do things and, and learn as, as whether this would work or not. And really that's what this talk is going to be about, sort of the, the journey we took um, through the technology to, tr to try to address this problem coming from a particle physics um, um, basis. And you know, there's a long history for these kind of, of measurement techniques, uh, for example, even here at Berkeley Lab. Um, this is the, a machine that was built in the 1970s called the Spiral Scanner, and it was used to automatically measure by optical methods uh, tracks observed in the bubble chamber. And actually in 68, when Louis Alvarez got the Nobel Prize, um, what the, among other things, what the citation said was that Alvarez and his assistants have constructed a series of more and more delicate automatic scanning and measuring instruments capable of transferring the information from photographic film into a state suitable for treatment by a computer. I mean, this is sort of obvious now, but in the 60s, it was really a very big step to, to marry measurement technology and digital computers, which were nascent, um, with, with a problem in physics analysis, and um, I think it was a very big step. And when you see what we've done here in our work, um, it very much uh, follows in spirit what, what these guys were doing, you know, back 30 years ago or more. So, uh, 
this is obviously everything is, is done collaboratively, but Vitaly Fedeyev, who's sitting here today, could be giving this talk as well. Um, he's a postdoc here at the lab that I've worked very, very, we've worked very, very closely together and, and, and really um, um, on this, made this work happen. Um, other folks at the lab have contributed in various ways. We have some external collaborators. And then we've, we've got a very nice relationship going with people at the Library of Congress and other places um, who are interested in this and have supported this uh, in various ways and companies and so forth. So, um, okay, so here, the problem that, that we're trying to address here, and I'll try to make it a little bit more formal, um, is that there are extensive historical sound collections existing worldwide in, in libraries and archives. And uh, it's not a coincidence, it's sort of a coincidence that all these problems begin with the letter D. But, you know, some of them are damaged, uh, delicate, decaying, and they're also diverse, meaning that they're all different types of materials, glass, plastics, waxes, metals, and so forth, that people used over the years to, to construct the, the, the basis for, for sound recording. Um, and so, the, the collections and the archives, they want to stabilize these collections in some way and, and preserve them. In addition, they want to move towards digitization on a very large scale of their entire collections. So they want to take thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, of recordings and find an efficient way to migrate them into the digital domain. And in the case of the United States, uh, the Library of Congress has been mandated to do this by an act of Congress itself, uh, ordering them to put their collections in digital form. So the archives use two words uh, to, to, to address these, these problems that I, that I outlined on the previous slide. Um, and one word they use is preservation. And what preservation means is, is they want to safeguard artifacts in such a way that they can be suitable for any possible foreseeable use in the future. And if you're going to do that, uh, it's got to be some sort of a prioritized process. The ones that are s somehow more important historically are going to be preserved first. Um, in the process of doing this, you want to do no harm. You don't want to set, set, back the set, the ba set them back in any way. And you want to apply the highest quality methods to the preservation that you can do. On the other hand, the other word they use is access. And what access means is, is it means putting entire collections into some form, which today is digital, in, in order that the public can broadly access them. And they want to let the public decide what they're interested in. They don't want to do it in a prioritized way. They don't want archivists or historians to make the choices. In order to do this, you need some sort of a mass processing because collections have thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, of items in them. You have to handle a very diverse set of media in all sorts of conditions. But the quality that you have to exercise to make this to make this access is not necessarily as great as the one that you would do if you're, if you're really working as a preservationist. So the approach that, that, um, that we're following um, is what we have various names for it, but you can sort of call it a non-contact. So we don't want to touch the medium in any way. So we uh, avoid these issues of, of further damage. Um, and so we have a non-contact approach, and it's based on digital imaging. So what is digital imaging? Well, this is a, a phonograph record, sort of a 78 RPM shellac disc. Many of you may never have seen such an object if you're <laughs> under, under 40. Uh, it's not a black CD, actually. It's, a, <laughs> it's, 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 it's something called a phonograph record. And, and if, you, if you take a picture of it with a suitable magnification, what you start to see is the image of the grooves as they're meandering around this, this surface. And this is just a picture like you take with a digital camera, although it's taken with magnification and so forth. But it's just a, what you normally call a 2D image of the surface. Um, these are cylinders. It's much more likely that some of you may never have seen these. I had actually never seen one until a couple of years ago. Um, and this was an alternate format that was available in the early years up till around 1930. And, um, if we take a, a picture of that, it actually has a, a texture to it. And so this is a sort of topographic image of a small sort of one by one millimeter but region of, of the surface. But it's, again, it's an image. Um, instead of intensity across the image, what we have is height. Now, if I have images like this that are on the computer, um, I can, in principle, do things with them to try and understand what the sound content is. And that's the basis of, of, of the work uh, we're going to talk about today. 
So let me backtrack a little bit and give you some more background. So here's the sort of very, very shortened history of sound recordings. Everybody thinks that Edison invented the phonograph. It's true, but in, in 1859, before Edison, there was a man called Leon Scott. And he invented this machine, which is called the phonoautograph. And what it was was a paper recorder. So people would talk, or sounds would impinge on this, on this horn, and the sound pattern would be scratched on a blackened piece of paper. So he could record, but he had no way of playing it back. So that's, well, it's true. You think it's funny, but he was more interested in what sound looked like from a physical point of view. He wasn't trying to make a, a, a player. Maybe if he had thought about it some more, he would have used foil, which Edison used. And Edison was actually able to reproduce sound. So that's really what Edison did. He, he didn't first record it, he first reproduced it. Well, this was a, a, a model of Edison's first recorder and re reproducer, and, and it, it had foil wrapped around it, and a needle would emboss the foil with impulses uh, corresponding to the sound. In 1885, Alexander Graham Bell, who we already knew about, and, and a man named Tainter, Tainter um, introduced wax as a recording medium rather than foil, and that was a much better material because it, it was more robust and it withstood multiple uses. Then, uh, in 1887, just 10 years after Edison, Emil Berliner invented something called the gramophone, which instead of using a cylinder, used a disc, which of course we're now very familiar with. Now, one of the nice things about discs is that you could stamp them rather than have to mold them on the inside of a mold, which has all sorts of problems associated with it. Uh, now, after, Tainer, uh, sorry, after Berliner invented the disc, he and Edison and the others got into a big fuss about what was better, discs or cylinders, and this is kind of like the Mac versus PC or the Beta versus VHS arguments that we've seen over the years. It was the same kind of thing. There were lawsuits and there were battles and there were advertising campaigns and all sorts of things about whether one had better sound and one was better this or that. And it went on and on and on until about 1929 when Edison died and people basically voted with their feet for the disc, which in the end was better because you could store more of them on a shelf. Okay. I mean, that's what, that's, what, that's what people say. Now, in, in 1925, um, Western Electric introduced an electrical system for recording. And this ended what was called the acoustic era, because before 1925, basically everything were, were diaphragms and linkages and horns. There were no amplifiers, there were no filters, there were none of the things that we're familiar with, but this came in in, 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 in 1925. And this changed uh, recording in a very dramatic way. So we had the war, and then in 1947, magnetic tape came into use. It was developed in Germany in the war years, but it came into use in the States after the war with Ampex. Um, in 1948, the 33 R R R RPM long playing record was introduced. Ten years later, stereo. Um, in 1963, the magnetic tape. So that was a big step backwards in the history of sound. Uh, <laughs> okay. then, of course, in 1982, some of you may have even been alive by this time, uh, you got the CD. This ended the analog era, so to speak. So you went from acoustic to electric, which was analog, and then you got into the digital era, and in 2001, you've got, you've got the iPod. And so that's, that kind of gives you a, a, a very uh, shortened sn snapshot of, of the history. Now, if we go in and look at the surfaces of these um, of these rec recorded media. Um, there are two, a couple of very important distinctions. One thing is, is how the sound is actually uh, um, encoded in the surface. In the case of a disc, uh, the monaural disc, the sound is encoded in a side-to-side -side undulation of the surface. And that's called a lateral recording because the, the groove moves from side to side. And so the grooves are roughly the same depth. This is sort of a cut through a few of these grooves. About 75 microns deep, that would be a couple of human hairs in, in, in depth. Um, and then this little gray band, that's supposed to indicate that the, that the side of the, the groove profile is just rigidly moving from side to side. And the stylus would rest sort of partway down the groove, and the groove would drag the stylus back and forth. And that would be the way the, the sound stored on the surface would be transferred into the stylus and the cartridge. Instead, on a cylinder, the sound is recorded in a vertical modulation of the surface. So it's called a vertical cut. So here, you've got ridges, which are roughly of constant height. And then you've got a valley, or a canyon floor. And the, and the depth of the canyon floor is varying. And that's pushing 
a stylus up and down as it rides through there. And so here's a cut through, through these, and this little band is supposed to indicate that the depth of this valley is going to vary. But the, the, the depth, the overall depth is only sort of 10 or 15 microns, so a fraction of a hair. And the modulation about that depth is, is on the scale of microns. So it's really amazing that, that uh, you know, 100 years ago, they were basically reproducing these things sort of industrially with these very, very small variations and, and the tolerances that would be associated with them. So now one of the big debates about all of this uh, between cylinders and discs was, well, discs that were easy to manufacture and store, but a cylinder, it had a constant speed as you went around, whereas in a disc, for a given tone, as you go tighter and tighter into the center, you would get tighter and tighter wiggles of the groove. And somehow Edison thought that, that mechanically that was a very bad thing. It ended up not to be such a bad thing. And, and, but they fought over this and what, you know, what, would, what would be the best way to do it. In the end, of course, the, as we know, the discs won. Um, just to kind of summarize these things, the, the, here this column is supposed to represent discs and this column is supposed to represent cylinders. The cut is lateral on a disc and it's vertical on a cylinder. The area containing audio uh, is 40, some 40,000 square millimeters or 20,000 square millimeters in these cases. If you unwound the groove on a, on a, on a, on a three minute 78, it'd be 150 meters long. The groove depth is fixed and it varies in, the, in this case, in that case. The interesting thing is that the amount of displacement that the groove makes about, say, its resting point um, for the, the noise level, essentially the lowest discernible level, is, is on the micron scale. And so if you want to measure these things somehow by, by methods that, 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 that are accessible to us, you need to measure sort of micron scale features over tens of thousands of square millimeters. So it's a, the disparity is large, and so you really have to have some efficient technique that you can throw at it. And that's where sort of the modern methods come to bear. So, so now, let me introduce you a little bit more to, to what the, the kind of plots we'll be looking at and things. So this is a, maybe many of you may have seen things like this, but this is an image of, of a sound waveform um, over time. So this is, I don't know, some 20 seconds or something of sound. and. I'm going to play this for you. It's just a pretty song off a modern CD, so it's, it's very good quality and there's no distortions or noise. And so as the singer's voice and the music modulates, you can sort of follow the shape. If we blow this up, you can see the, the real microstructure of the waveform, all the different overtones laid upon each other and, and so forth. And of course, an alternate way of looking at all of this is to take the Fourier transform of this waveform. So this would now be frequency zero to 20,000 hertz. And these little peaks that you see are particular frequencies that are strongly present um, within the waveform. So this is just for your enjoyment since you listen to this whole discussion. Will you stay with me? Will you be my love among the fields of barley? Right, now, so this is what we've come to expect in terms of the quality of sound when, when we buy things now. Um, here's a similar waveform, but now from a very old recording. This is maybe 80 years old or something, and um, I'm going to play it. It's a completely different material. This, this song had not been written at that time. And, uh, and what you're going to hear are some examples of some of the problems that, that these older recordings uh, suffer from. There's going to be a gap in between because it's two pieces of the same recording and I just wanted to separate them. But listen carefully, you're going to hear a kind of continuous noise, a kind of shh sound. And that's hit what the audio people call hiss. And it's, a, and it's caused by the sort of irregularities, continuous irregularities in the surface of the media. Then you're going to hear lots of discrete kind of clicking sounds. That's the sound of discrete scratches and pieces of dust and dirt. And then in this section, you're going to hear a very regular clicking sound, and that's a scratch across many tracks of the groove, and so every time it hits it, which is going to be almost periodic, you're going to hear that same sound. That's 
the gap. Okay, so that, I think that's clear, right? The, 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 the quality is, is much degraded. Some people find it quaint, but generally speaking, the quality is much degraded from what we've come to expect from, from our modern technology. And presumably it didn't sound this way when it was first recorded, but, but time has, has taken its toll on, on the material. So now, those were kind of examples now, now, uh, of, of sort of from, this, from the sound point of view. Here's some examples of the actual media that, that um, inhabit these collections. And this is also to make the point, A, that the media is very diverse. There are all different types of materials, and I'll go through them. And also, I'm going to play you a bunch of sound clips here, which, which are going to, I hope, make you appreciate how interesting the material that is stored in these collections are. There's going to be a bunch of different examples of things that you might find uh, in, in an archive, some obviously more dramatic ones, but, but um, you know, to show you and hopefully make you agree that, that such a, a preservation effort is, 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 is indeed also worthwhile. So here's again the shellac disc. The main problem with them is that they get worn down, scratched, and they break. And they were really the main commercial media, b say, before 1950. And, uh, and uh, so here's a typical uh, early 40s. From the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore. From the queen of flowing mountains to the south hill by the shore. She's mighty tall and handsome and known quite well by all. She's the combination on the wall, and Now, similar to what we heard with, with Caruso in, in the previous slide. Now, before magnetic tape was introduced, uh, th there was a media called lacquer or also aluminum. Uh, they were called instantaneous recording discs. And what somebody would do is they would use a needle to scratch directly into the surface the pattern of sound. And those were used very, very widely uh, before in the pre-war years, particularly to record radio uh, broadcasts, speeches, interviews, uh, session takes in a studio. Uh, people who went out into the field to do anthropological, linguistic, or ethnomusicological research typically used these things um, to record the primary sources. So I'm going to play you a little clip here, which was recorded by John Lomax, who was an important uh, sound collector. This was in the 1930s, and he recorded this on such media in a prison in um, in Virginia, so around 1935. Now the problem with this media is that it's very delicate and it flakes, the, the, the coatings flake off and they also exude the co chemical components and they get covered with a pasty uh, kind of goop. And so there's a lot of issues for the preservationists and the people who want to get access to these type of materials. These are the cylinders. Um, they're either made of wax or plastic. Uh, they suffer from mold growth. There's a mold that grows on them and actually eats the wax. Uh, they break, obviously, uh, and they get worn down. So here's two clips. Um, the first one is, I'm going to tell you what it is, because nobody gets it when they first hear it, but if you know what it is, you'll hear it. It's, it's Alfred T Lord Tennyson himself reciting a portion of his famous poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. So that's not the reason why theirs is but to do and die. And so now if you know this, I think you, you'll, you'll hear it. Did you all hear him say that? Yeah. Okay, good. good. Okay. Um, this one's a little easier to hear. This is another cylinder. This is also in the 19th century. That was 1884. This is Edison himself, and he's talking about a trip he made around the world. So he's just going to be listing this, the places he went. And then we'll go to Calcutta. Calcutta to Singapore on the Daily Archipelago. And then to, uh, Hong, Kong, to Hong Kong. <coughs> Hong Kong to Tokyo. Tokyo on the Pacific Mail. 
that which is go to object, object to uh, Narani, Narani Chaya, Chaya to Omaha, Omaha to Chicago, Chicago to Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, New York. Now, Mr. Blaine, what you say if you went on another cylinder to so my young So you could hear that. He's San Francisco, Ogden, New York, and so forth. Now, another interesting media which, which exists in the, in the collections um, are called plastic dictation belts. And these were things that were used sort of in the 1940s to the 1960s to record interviews, testimony, phone conversations, um, and so, all sorts of things. They were only really meant to be played back once or twice. They break, they crack, they get worn down. And, uh, there's a, but there's a lot of very historically interesting stuff uh, on such uh, dictation belts. So one uh, very famous dictation belt uh, is, is, is um, one which was recorded by the Dallas Police Department. Uh, they were using dictation machines to monitor their radio traffic. And when President Kennedy was shot, there was a, a, such a machine running and, and recording the incoming radio traffic from, from the uh, various officers in the field. So I'm going to play you a clip from one of the belts that, 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 that the Dallas PD recorded. This was the one that was recorded uh, in the half an hour after the president was shot. So you're going to hear uh, policemen sort of doing a bulletin and talking about looking for somebody and so forth, but I think it will be quite recognizable. But it kind of shows you the, the quality of the sound that on, some, on some of this material. So you, could you make that out? They're talking about a male, 5 feet, 10 inches with a rifle, which is you know, presumably was Oswald. So uh, the last one I'm going to play you was also a, dic a dictation belt recording. It turned it out, out that LBJ used the dictation machines and, uh, and recorded all his phone conversations on these things. And uh, there are thousands of them in the Johnson Library in Texas. So this is one very interesting one. Was recorded just a few months after the assassination. He was obviously in the White House at this point, so it's 1964, and he's talking to McGeorge Bundy, who was his national security advisor. I'll tell you, the more I just stayed awake last night thinking about this thing, the more I think of it, I don't know what in the hell uh, it looks like to me we're getting into another Korea. It just worries the hell out of me. I don't see what we can ever hope to get out of there with once we're committed. Once I believe the Chinese communists coming into it, I don't think that we can fight them 10,000 miles away from home and ever get anywhere on, uh, in that area. I don't think it's worth fighting for, and I don't think we can get out. And it's just the biggest damn mess. It is. So. It's an awful mess. And we just got to think about it. I look at this sergeant of mine this morning. got six little old kids over there, and he's done things and bringing me in the night reading and all that kind of stuff. And I just thought about ordering or the kids in there, there, and what in the hell am I ordering him out there for? One what thing that the is the hell worth to me. What is Laos worth to me? What is worth to this country? <laughs> Now, you know, Johnson was clever. He may have had alternate versions of this conversation, you know, with, you know, with the other, you know, uh, uh, opinions. But, but, okay, I think, I feel, and I, I hope you'll agree, that there's a tremendously interesting collection of materials in, you know, in these collections, and, and, uh, and it's a worthy cause to, to try and preserve them and also create greater access for the public to appreciate what's in this, in this history. So, Obviously, there's a whole field of, of audio restoration that already exists, and you can go to your record store and you can buy some of these old recordings of Caruso or whoever, and they don't sound too bad. And the reason is um, that there's a series of, of methods that the audio professionals have worked out, and they're pretty powerful. Um, one, they kind of fall into two pieces. One is materials. They can clean these old recordings, they can choose special needles, special styli, and they can repair them. They can do these things, but it's labor intensive. And then once they, they play these things with a stylus, um, now they're signals. And the signals can be processed 
They can be filtered, and there are very powerful filtering algorithms that exist now, particularly digital, which can remove hiss, clicks, pops, <coughs> change the pitch, and so forth. And they have a, a bunch of other tricks they can do, comparing multiple samples of the same recording, or looking at alternate sides of the group. So you can do a lot of, of very, very uh, powerful and successful things to audio and, and, bring it, and bring it back and restore it. However, all of this work requires two things. You've got to have the skill to do it. So you have the trained expertise. And you have to touch the media. You have to go in contact with it. And what, where we're sort of, our point of embarkation now is, is to sort of see, well, what can we bring to the table to sort of move away from these requirements? So the approach, as I said, was, is non-contact digital imaging. So we would hope to protect the samples from further damage by not touching them. And um, once you get things into the form of a digital image, you can sort of take the Photoshop mentality and say, well, I can touch things up. So if there's damage in a recording, like a scratch or a skip or dirt, to a certain extent, you may be able to touch it up and actually remove it from the image and thereby improve the sound. It's a, it's a filtering approach, but it's a filtering approach at the level of the image, not at the level of the waveform anymore. Furthermore, to the extent that this is all now computerized, you may be able to offload various aspects of the whole restoration process to sort of special software. And so if you can bring these, these elements in, you may be able to overcome the need for very skilled labor to do these things and, of course, the need to contact the material. And so you can think of this approach as sort of a smart copying machine for records. So the method is, obviously, digitally image the surface, um, cover that surface with a whole bunch of views or grids to collect lots of data, stitch together that surface into a, into a map, process that image, as I said, to try and touch it up or move the defects, analyze that image to model the motion of the stylus, um, sample that image or that model at some standard frequency, and then finally convert it into a digital sound format. Um, and we never thought we would sort of build a real-time player. It was, the idea was more to, to treat these things as a problem in measurement make the measurements, move into the digital realm, and then not go back and feel that you needed to play it over and over again based on the original material. So, um, so now I'll, I'll, I'll bring you through the steps. So for a, 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 for a disc which has a lateral groove, you can get a very high resolution image of the surface which has sufficient magnification, sort of mapping one pixel in your imager to about one micron on the disk surface, you can get sufficient resolution in, in, with appropriate images to measure the undulations of the groove in, with sufficient detail to get down to basically the noise level in, in the recordings. And here's one such image, and it's, it's lit in a very special way. The light is all perpendicular to the surface. So this white area over here, well, that's the, the flat, the very top surface of the record. This white stripe over here, that's the very bottom of the groove, which is actually flat. And then anything that's not flat, the light reflects off in some other direction, doesn't get back up into the camera. And so the side walls of the groove are the black areas. And so these, these images um, form a, a basis for you know, one approach that, that you can apply to this, to this problem. If I zoom in on one of these things, you can actually start to see a defect, a piece of dirt or dust that's sitting in the groove, and presumably if the, if the stylus encountered this thing, it would have resulted in one of these clicks that we heard. But it's so small that if it's removed from the image and I just extrapolate across the missing region, we don't really lose much information, and, and, the, and the impression that we have listening to it is, is, is improved. Um, now, that, that, that's fine for, for the, the side-to-side -side group, but if we actually want to measure depth, well, a camera is not very good at measuring the distance to things. It's good at measuring transversely. If you want to measure the distance, there's a bunch of other techniques that you can bring to bear. And the one that we ended up using um, takes, takes advantage of, the, of an effect called chromatic aberration, which is usually a bad thing, but sometimes you can turn a bad thing into a good thing. So any lens will, will bend the different colors of light slightly differently. And so what this is showing is the different colors coming into focus at different points. In a photograph, this can cause a sort of blooming of color that we can see around edges, and it's not nice. So a good lens for a good camera doesn't have a large chromatic aberration. But instead, you can actually use this technique, and there's a, a method which is called 
confocal scanning, uh, there's a version of confocal scanning, where you, what you do is you create a, a pinpoint spot of light and you focus it down on a surface through a lens that has a large chromatic aberration. The different colors of light come into focus at different depths. They reflect back off the surface through a beam splitter, back through another pinhole into a spectrometer. And the spectrometer senses which colors come back bright in focus. And that can be correlated with the distance. And so by taking a probe like this, and it just, it sh it just shoots a small point down, but by scanning it over the surface and recording the heights, you can, in this hierarchical way, you can actually build up a topographic image of the surface. And that's how this picture was, was created. It's a commercial device that you can buy, and it can measure, they're getting faster actually with time, they can measure like 4,000 points per second scanning across the surface. So it's a, it's a very effective tool for measuring heights, and it's the one that we settled upon when we, try, when we thought we would look at, at, at vertical media. Um, these methods are not necessarily very fast. Some variations on them can be fast. For example, uh, <clears throat> if, if you want to scan a disk with a digital camera, if you choose the appropriate cameras, you can scan a sort of three minute disk in a few times three minutes. Um, you create very large amount of data, which you can then process down you know, towards reasonable sizes, where the sort of standard is set by your 88 kilobytes for one second of audio. That's what you've got on your CD today. Um, if you want to scan the depth, you need to use the confocal probe, which I was describing a moment ago, and there it takes many, many hours to cover the surface. So this is sort of speaking a little bit more towards what I was calling preservation, and this is maybe speaking a little bit more towards what we were calling access. Um, not maybe n faster, maybe, the quali maybe you're not getting as much information. Here, very, very detailed measurements, but rather slow. Uh, Here's an example of an image, and once you've got this image in digital form, the computer can ask really meaningful questions about it. For example, you can look at contrast variations across the image, and you can do edge finding, and you can actually locate very accurately contours. And this is an example of, a, of an edge finding algorithm, just going in and measuring on a very tight grid of points the position of the groove as it meanders around the record. And that is, in, in, in fact, the basis of how we to take data off these, off these disks. Um, an interesting thing is, is the relationship um, between the groove shape that you actually measure and the sound that you actually hear. The, the sound is not actually the, the groove shape. It turns out that, that because in, in the case of an electrical recording, uh, induction is playing a role of taking the stylus motion into a current, it's the velocity of the stylus. This is supposed to be a groove that, that you're riding through. It's the velocity of the stylus, which is really the sound, not the position of the stylus. And so if we want to actually get the sound off these things, instead of measuring just the shape of the groove, we actually have to measure the slope as you go around the record from point to point. In the audio world, this is called the constant velocity condition, but it's a term that people like to hear. But really, you have to you have to think of it as a velocity measurement or a slope measurement rather than a shape measurement. Um, in the acoustic case, uh, it's of the dog and the horn and the diaphragm and the linkage and the stylus. So it's not using magnetic induction anymore. And so the question is, what's, when you have an acoustic recording, what's, what is it that, that actually creates the, um, the sound? And it, it's a long kind of argument that you go through, but essentially um, what happens is, is that a horn it is a device that, that lets you extend the response of a small diaphragm uh, to lower frequencies. The plane waves uh, that, that, that propagate down this horn, um, well, they have their pressure and velocity proportional and in phase. Um, and the diaphragm is a harmonic oscillator that's driven. You want it to have a pretty flat frequency response so that you can cover the audio range. That only happens if it's heavily overdamped. Um, if it's overdamped, well then the velocity follows the driving force, it, at least until you get to very high frequencies when the mass takes over. And so it turns out that for a whole set of arguments which are different than, than the other case, um, you get uh, the same velocity is sound condition also on, a, uh, on, a, uh, on an acoustic recording. So I'm going to now tell you about the tests um, that we did to, to try and develop this and, and tell you where it's, where it's going. So um, 
here's a picture of Vitaly, and what he's doing is he's looking here at, a, at an automatic measuring machine that we had in the lab. And when we got the idea to, um, to, to, to do this, Vitaly programmed this machine to go in and measure the shape of the groove trajectory on thousands of images over the surface of this, of this recording. And those little crosses that you see, those are the determination of, by this machine of where the groove trajectory is going. Once we had these crosses, they could be output in a form where we could actually build a map um, to relate the measurements off the images to an actual trajectory. And Vitaly wrote a program to, to actually process all that data and take this is now those, those points that we were talking about. We actually measured them on both sides of the groove, so they kind of paralleled each other. And <clears throat> one of the interesting things is that you can start asking questions like, what's the distance across the groove? And here's a plot of that. And if that distance does not fall within some measured range, you know that you're measuring dust or dirt or something which is not groove-like. And so it's an example of, of, a, of a way you can start to cut bad data out of, out of your, your images. So a whole series of these images are taken. Um, these things are then measured. You can average over them. You get this smooth, smooth that waveform. And then you can differentiate this, and you can get this shape. And that's actually now something which is getting to be the actual sound waveform. Um, here's the result of that. If you then put it into, into an actual sound format, um, we started off with a sort of randomly chosen disk, and um, uh, turned out that that, that one uh, had also a, a, a commercially restored CD version available too, um, which is based on, on early tape recordings, a sort of not late 1940s recording. Um, here's the waveform as measured optically by the stylus. You can see a lot more clicks and pops because the stylus is seeing all the scratches, which can be instead eliminated optically. And there's the CD version. And you can see the microwave forms are very, very similar, point by point. This is some 40 milliseconds of sound. Um, and now I'll play that for you. So here's a sort of reference version. So this is sort of the, what the professionals did. In my dreams, good night, Irene, good night, Irene, I'll see you. So that, that's sort of the best we can help. B by the way, many of you probably heard this song, right? It's, it's a popular song. Um, a lot of children like it. My nephew used to sing it because they thought it was a lullaby. If you actually listen to the words, it's about murder, adultery, suicide, and drugs. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it, okay. Um, it's still pretty, but <laughs> it was written by Lead Belly, or um, famous uh, folk singer of the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and it was actually, he was found by John Lomax, and, and there's a whole story there. This version was actually uh, uh, performed by the Weavers, which was a popular act in the 1950s and 1960s. And okay, so here's, if we take that disc and we play it with a needle. Then um, now if we go and do this whole measurement process that I described and, and, and here's the result of that. Now you can see that clearly the hiss, the clicks and pops have been reduced um, by this process, and that was also borne out in the waveform. Um, there's still an, a hiss that you can hear under uh, underlying the sound, and you can further reduce that if you want to add additional filtering to it. I won't bother to play that, but you know you're free now to to throw additional tools at it if you like. So um, we we took this, we we did this work. Uh, some couple years back, and, and we wrote a paper about it, and we, and we sent it around, and we sent it to the Library of Congress on a number of people. And the Library of Congress was very interested. And they said that, you know, that test was very promising, you know, they thought the sound quality was, was quite respectable, and that it, it certainly showed potential. And so they asked the lab, essentially, you know, can you actually make a machine that instead of 
being based upon this old, this existing piece of equipment, you know, would be optimized to run and, 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 and run fast on disk. I, I, I neglected to mention that in that original test, it took about 40 minutes to take the measurements that resulted in one second of sound. So it was very, very slow. So they said, that, that's impractical. Can you do that? Um, the other thing, and so this actually grew into a proposal that, that they sort of asked us, asked us to do, which ended up getting called IRENE, and you'll see why in a second. And now the lab is actually supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities to do this, to actually build a machine for the Library of Congress, and, and this will happen over the next year. Um, in addition, they said, you know, what about cylinders and using those 3D methods to try and measure cylinders. And that's an effort that they've also supported here at the lab as a more of an R&D thing. And I'm gonna give you a couple examples of that. So the reason it's called IRENE is, well, it was a great acronym. <laughs> Image Reconstruct Erase Noise. And it gave it, you know, all this upgrade, you know. Right. So we're always talking about upgrades. So, um, so that was a good, good thing. Okay, it's just what you might think. It's got a, a, a uh, some kind of a camera and a turntable and a computer and you know it does it does performs these scans and in fact um, what it, w the nice thing about it is that is that instead of using a, a normal digital camera what you do is you put what's called a line scan camera on it it's a and you orient the line to go across the groups and then you rotate the record underneath the camera and so what it does then is it just takes the record and it unrolls it into a long stripe and so Every one of these is a line that's just built up. And this is about an eighth of one revolution around the record. If you zoom in on this, what you start to see is the detail of the groove. And here's the, the computerized edge finding algorithm actually going in and finding all these, all these points. Here's the machine itself in prototypical form, uh, sitting on a vibration table. There's an arch, uh, cameras, and appropriate lenses. There's a turntable that rotates the record underneath. And there's a laser that monitors the surface of the record and as the warpage moves it up and down, that there's a real-time feedback loop that moves the camera up and down in order to, to, to keep the focus um, uh, well controlled. This thing uh, can, can measure about one second of audio in about 10 seconds. So it's a like, factor of 300 faster than what we had you know, in the original test. And it's approaching, with brighter light sources, it, you know, it'll reach the sort of few times real time needs that, that the library has. So this is something that's going on now, and actually is set up in a room not too far from where we're sitting today. Um, we tested it, and um, here's, here's a, a comparison of, of something which now is taken at sort of 10 seconds per second. So here's the stylus version of a familiar song. And you should vote for the Kate Smith stamp, which the U.S. still doesn't have. Okay. And, um, and, and now here's Irene, the machine itself, measuring the, that same disc. Then, okay, so that was sort of, well, okay, it basically, you know, meets the quality of, of, of the playing it with a stylus. Here's a really damaged, uh, very much older and damaged record um, played with a needle and then scanned with Irene. Okay, and then... So you can see a lot of that superficial noise associated with the dirt is kind of gone now from it. Um, here's a, a much more, uh, here's a, a rather distorted sound. It, it, there's something actually in, in the high frequencies that, that sounds like it's resonating. Okay, and we're here when we scanned it with them. Okay, so, you know, that, that's kind of told us that the machine was r roughly approaching the levels that it needed to, to, to operate on. And so this is now going to happen and, and is an ongoing effort here at the lab. So the final thing I want to tell you about is, is the actual um, Edison cylinders. Here's the confocal probe that I described. 
And what it does is it scans the axis of the cylinder, cylinder rotates, it scans again, and it builds up images that look like this. These are the a cut through, I don't know, a dozen grooves as, as you go along the axis. And um, we take many of these images, you put them all together, and you get an overall image of the surface. And this is, if this was a, so this is angle around the axis, distance along the cylinder, and this is a couple of hundred microns. This is showing the distortions in the surface, so they're the grooves themselves. Um, and these distortions, if you listen to them, they sound like thumps and low frequency noise. Um, and then if you take the derivative of all this, a um, nice way to do that is to go into the frequency domain and, and then every term picks up a factor of its, of its frequency and it, so you get essentially a 6 dB boost um, when you differentiate. Um, here's a waveform measured with the confocal probe and played by a needle. Again, very, very similar structures. Um, I'll play you um, examples. Um, this is a... Um, played with a needle. So this is about a hundred year old cylinder. Okay, so now I'll play you the optical version of it. interesting thing is, if you look at the way these recordings were done, you got these guys and they're sort of crowded around this horn, and the horn is shaped like a cone. Now, they didn't know much about the physics of horns until the sort of 1918 or so, and if they had known, what they would have known was that a conical horn does not have as good low frequency transmission as a horn that flares, an exponential horn, and this plot shows the difference between the exponential and the conical horn at low frequency. So we're free if we want to to go back and compensate for this by re-equalizing the, the, the different frequencies. And we did that essentially you know, for fun uh, and also added some additional filtering to it and, and what you get is this. So all three of these were really measured on the same physical cylinder, and you can see pretty dramatic improvement as you move you know, through the technology. Okay, so finally, um, the last thing I want to talk about uh, and then end the talk is, is sort of kind of where the rubber hits the road on, on this whole preservation area, which is um, mold. And, and mold is something which you know, the archivists and the collectors are just sort of sick about, that you know, it just destroys these things. And so the question was, you know, could we go into the moldy regions, and this is actually a, a lightly molded region, a lightly moldy region, could we go in there and actually pull the sound out um, that otherwise would be lost? So it happened that we, we came across some cylinders that had an interesting um, pattern of mold on it. The mold was in sort of two stripes, one on this side and one on the other side. And here's a little vi vision, version of the, of the, of the grooves as you go across. They're very irregular, even in, even in the good region of, on this particular one. And this is a plot that essentially is a measure of the quality of the surface as we go around the axis. And so there are those sort of two moldy regions uh, of it. So, well, if you approach this like a physicist, what you do is you, is, you, is you essentially, you do a whole run through the data and then you try to use the data as a, as a calibration. And what you see here are, are little track segments as we go, this again is angle around the disc, little track segments and then regions of, of, of lost, essentially lost data. But what we can do is we can actually use this information to help ourselves, help guide our way around. And we did it in this one. It turns out that these um, cylinders come from Jack London's estate. And there's Jack and Charmaine, his wife. This is around 1915. Uh, these are the actual machines that London used. Uh, they're at the Oakland Museum right now for restoration. Um, this is not a finished um, project by any means, and it, it's very distorted because whenever we pass through the moldy regions, there's a distortion. But 
I, I was obviously very excited by the chance to work on the cylinder and see, you know, if I could actually hear what Jack London sounded like. Apparently there are no recordings of Jack London, so um, the, here's what we got when, when we did it. Can you hear that? Does it sound like a man or a woman? Woman. Yeah, so actually I've heard it a hundred times or something, and, 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 and you can actually make some of it out, and, and she, it is a woman, so it's presumably Charmaine. She's dictating a letter because you can hear her saying period, paragraph, and so forth, and she mentions the Lusitania, and when the war is over, and so uh, it's about, it must have been about 1915, which is just before Jack died. Anyway, so obviously not there yet, but it's an interesting example of what you know, we hope to be able to do with these methods. Um, and maybe you know, there'll be, of course, other opportunities like this um, in, in the future. Now, we got a certain amount of press coverage for all this uh, work, and some of you may have read some of these articles, all sorts of different uh, journals and papers around the world uh, you know, found this an interesting story. Which is nice. It's nice to be able to share, you know, the work in physics and how it might impact another field. Um, we even got somehow in, in Physics Today, they even wrote an article about this. And then I found an article that a music professor wrote, which he gave basically for a music audience um, describing our work. And this was the title of the paper that, the article that he himself wrote. So, <laughs> okay. and I thought that was great. Okay. So, so, okay, that's basically it. Thank you. Um, you know, we, I think these methods show a lot of promise. Um, the 2D approach is actually going to become a machine. Uh, the 3D methods, I think, do a pretty good job, although they're kind of slow. Um, there's an ongoing program here, obviously a lot of interest. There's a website where a lot of this is, is for, you can look at. And there are actually two papers that have been published now um, in, in describing this work. Thank you.